Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I have Julia Blackwell, the fascial release therapist, back on today. And we're going to be talking about trauma and trauma stuck in the body, but we're also going to be talking about plantar fasciitis, what happens when you get whiplash, how to work on improving recovery after an injury and even a fracture. Exciting stuff here, great stuff, great takeaways. So let's reintroduce you to Julia Blackwell. Hey, health junkies. I had such a great time talking with Julia Blackwell last time that I had to bring her on again. Plus, there are some things going on in my world that I think maybe you guys might relate to. So I figured let's just tell a little bit of my story and then we'll talk about trauma today and kind of dive into things. So Julia, welcome back to the Health Fix podcast. Thanks, Janine. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you back on again. And since we talked before, I have been working through the Roller Remedy. This is Julia's course, guys. And it's been helping me to really loosen up. And and I no joke, like loosen up my back that we just found out has an L5S1 herniation. And and so in my mind, I'm like, you know, we know, and, and as a doc, I know that a lot of people will have crazy herniations and they'll have no pain in that particular area. And so I can't help but think that my pain is somewhat also related to some trauma in my life as well, too. So let's let's dive into talking about trauma in the fascial tissue. And how did you start to really come to think about how trauma lodges itself in the body in this particular aspect? Sure. Yeah. I had no idea that that was a thing. Um, We talked about this a little bit on the previous podcast, but I was born with very severe nerve damage to my right shoulder, um, grew up with a lot of just incessant tightness, tension, um, an uncomfortable feeling in my body um, and did not make any connection at all that uh, there might be some trauma and some emotions stored uh, in my body from that experience. But when I discovered fascia release and this kind of specific type of fascia release work back in 2011, I want to say it was maybe the following year in 2012, I had one of my instructors just very gently uh, grab my SEM, which is that more meaty part of your neck. And it was so gentle. And he just gently grabbed it and had me tilt my head a little bit, nod my head up and down and tears just started streaming down my face. And as is so typical of most of us, as soon as we start crying, we're like, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have no idea why this is happening. And they had to explain to me like, oh, hey, you know, this is on your right side. This is where you had a really intense nerve regraft surgery. This is where you had a birth trauma. Um, it's completely possible that you have this emotion stored in your tissue. And it just completely blew my mind because yeah, it it didn't hurt. I had no idea it was coming. It was just uncontrollable tears suddenly uh, just coming out of my face. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And as I started working with, with more and more people, as I learned this type of fascia release for myself, I was like, oh, this happens a lot actually. Um, So that kind of started my interest in just seeing, yeah, where trauma might be living in our fascia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, I mean, for those of you guys listening, these things happen all the time. Julia has explained it. It happens to me a lot while I'm doing acupuncture with folks. You know, it's happened to me before when I had an acupuncture session. You know, it's 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 part of the experience. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, gosh, well, I don't want to have that happen. Guys, it's freeing. You felt better after it all went down, didn't you? Yeah. And there's, there's a quote that I'm so sorry, I forget who said it, but it's like, bliss is any emotion felt all the way through. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we don't want to sometimes bring up anything that makes us cry or feel angry, or, you know, it's not always tears. It could be anger. It could be um, multiple things, but it's like letting yourself feel it all the way through when it comes up is such a liberating thing that that energy is now completely out of your body. And it makes such a difference for your physical, mental, and emotional health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ah, just the bliss. That is, that's what we're after here. So, you know, Mm -hmm. one of the things a lot of people ask me, because 
they're called different things. And I think we talked a little bit about it in the previous podcast too, is, is how does the fascial tissue feel when someone has had trauma or when someone is under a lot of stress? And we, I talked about gummies and things of that nature. I'd love for you to kind of describe kind of what a extremely stressed body or extremely traumatized body feels like. Sure. So um, I will just remind everyone briefly that within our fascia, which is like this plastic wrap that wraps around every single thing in our body, we have all of these proprioceptors and free nerve endings. So our fascia is very sensitive. It's probably the most sensitive organ we have. And it's constantly taking in information about both our external environment, you know, what's happening in the world around us and also our internal environment. So what is our experience on the inside? And Mm -hmm. so Uh, We could have stress happening in both of those environments, um, but especially if we have a lot of internal anxiety or have experienced trauma, fascia is going to respond to those stimuli, um, usually by tightening up or thickening or becoming dehydrated. So there's a couple things. If if you're overall just very chronically stiff, and I I don't mean just one area, like kind of the shoulders, the hips the ankles, you know, everything just feels stiff or very rigid. If it's hard to get into a full range of motion or do certain things, um, you might be one of those people that are constantly getting injured. You know, you pull a hamstring Mm -hmm. and then you heal that. And the next week you've, you know, popped out your shoulder, you know, there's just this constant string of injuries. Um, a big one is simply posture because again, our fascia is, trying to protect us and, um, you know, based off of what information it's receiving, I usually find someone who is very hunched over kind of collapsing in at the chest. Um, that's a really good indicator. You know, uh, do you ever see a depressed person standing up really tall and straight? (laughs) You know, we can kind of see our body actually pulling in on itself to protect us. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, you may find you're doing a lot of shallow chest breathing up in the chest or even up in the neck instead of being able to breathe all the way down in the low abdomen. It might feel really difficult to do that. Um, and also just feeling very disconnected from your body is a huge one. If you're a little uncoordinated and I'm not talking like, you know, <laughs> I trip all the time while hiking or, you know, accidentally run into a door frame or something, but like really struggling to figure out where your body is in space. You know, that's that proprioceptive element, right? Is how much force should we be using? Where, where do we need to position our body to correctly make a motion? And I find a lot that that dissociation really having a difficulty being in your body is a good signal that fascia is very tight. It's a little bit overloaded with information and, um, probably has some pent up and stored things in it. Mm. That's a good description. And, and I think I have a lot of patients that have come to me over the years and been like, yeah, I, I don't feel comfortable in my body. And, and often it tends to somewhat happen too, as we transition from perimenopause and menopause and, and hormones are changing and things are changing on that side of things. Is there anything you've noticed or trends you've noticed with seeing certain patients that in that menopausal range, we tend to kind of have more like manifestations of, of the trauma even, or, or just in general? I have definitely seen a trend that there's more pain in the body. So as hormones are shifting, as just the body is shifting, as we get older, um, I've seen more people come in with, um, you know, joint pain all over or more chronic symptoms. Um, and it might be, yeah, like there's a lot of chemical changes, but you know, as we get older, our fascia starts to become a little bit less hydrated. We're slowly losing that water and we have to be more aware of putting that water back into the fascia as much as possible. And so, um, I had definitely seen a lot more aches and pains, um, in that regard. Um, I also wanted to share, I once worked with this lady, I'll never forget this. (laughs) Um, It was really early on when I was practicing, which I think I would have handled this differently um, if it were now, but I had this lady who, um, you know, was actually pretty young. I bet she was in her thirties 
and she had this horrible nerve pain all over her body. And she did disclose to me before we started that she had experienced a lot of trauma in her life. And so I'm thinking in my head, oh, wow, I bet the fascia is going to be super tight and it's going to be crazy and it's going to be this huge thing, maybe some emotional releases and started working on things and was like, whoa, I don't feel anything. I'm not feeling knots. I'm not feeling textural differences. It all feels pretty malleable and squishy. And we continue working all over the body and I'm still getting this just lack of feedback from her tissue. And I was like, wow, that is so wild. It seems like absolutely nothing is going on in here. And as we got to the end of our session, it suddenly occurred to me that I think she was so dissociated from her body because she couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel anything either. Mm. And we had a conversation of like, Hey, uh, I think you'll have to really be in your body and be comfortable being in your body to do this work because your body's got to show me its cards essentially. And right now it is so stuffed down that, yeah, I'm, I'm not really feeling anything. And I remember get, telling her that and, and she never came back. And I think about her all the time because <laughs> it was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to just be in my body. And I've seen a lot of that um, just overall since that experience is like, oh, interesting. Sometimes I may not be feeling a whole lot or maybe you're doing some releases on your own and you're like, ah, I don't know if this is helping. I can't tell if it's ha- helping. I, I can't really tell a difference is like that dissociation from the body is also something I'm, I'm seeing more and more in my practice. Mm. No, I I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you that, yes, there's that disconnect where we we don't. And some people have learned this through talking with their counselors and folks. So they kind of know, you know, that they dissociate. But some folks don't really realize that. And and sometimes they'll they'll I'll hear like, hey, I went to the massage therapist, but she said she couldn't find anything on me. That's like what you're describing. It's like a huge clue in there. Mm-hmm. So, so now moving forward, you've had more experience, you find folks like this, what's, what's your post or what are you saying? Like even right off the bat, when you start feeling the tissue, what do you say to them? Um, I ask a lot of questions, possibly an annoying amount when, <laughs> when I start sensing that they're having a tough time describing what's happening in their body or, um, you know, it could be, again, I'm feeling very little, but I know something is there or maybe I'm feeling a lot and they seem to not have a reaction to Mm. what I'm releasing. So there's kind of a spectrum, but I ask a lot of questions of like, Hey, can you describe this even more? Is there a temperature? Is it hot or cold? You know, is it achy? Is it sharp? You know, even if I need to give them the words to start pausing for a second and being like, what do I feel in this moment? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Can I describe it a little bit further? Um, And I certainly talk a lot and implement a lot of breathing practices into fascia release, because if you're focusing on your breath, you have to be present in the moment and bringing that presence to this exact moment in time really helps bring people back into their body. So those are usually my first steps of like, let's make it as safe as possible in here. You know, let's really try to hone in on what specifically you're feeling. And it may take a few times, you know, I've certainly had people that could not describe to me, you know, what it felt like to release their fascia for two, three times. And then they're like, Oh, I'm feeling a lightness. Now I'm feeling a little bit of tingling. And you're like, yay, everything's reconnecting. (laughs) That's awesome. It's good that you can explain like what they're supposed to feel too. And so possibly we should go through kind of like a whole range of like what you feel, what you're looking for, and then what folks should feel after or during or, or kind of throughout the whole process and even like a couple of days later. So let's have you explain to folks just so we, we get an idea of like what's normal ish you know, or what, what's to be expected. Yeah, that's probably better. Term. Yeah. Well, when, when releasing fascia, it's normal to feel, um, either hot or cold. I've, I've had people tell me both. Usually the heat is a blood flow rush of blood flow, getting back into an area. 
Um, the cool rush is is less common, but I I believe I cannot prove it. I'm sorry, friends. Um, I believe that some of the extracellular matrix, which is the fluid specifically in our fascia, that's rushing back into an area that might just have a different temperature sensation. Um, it's normal to feel kind of a lightness in your body, some gentle tingling, um, just maybe an easier range of motion, more freedom in a joint, things like that. Um, we certainly want to avoid anything that feels sharp or kind of bony, like you're digging into too much of a bone, anything that feels electrically. So um, usually, you know, nerves weave in and out of our our muscles and our tissues, and it may depend on your specific anatomy, how close certain nerves are to the surface. So if you're working and something feels super tingly, like your arms falling asleep, or it's like an electrical jolt, we definitely want to avoid that. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. as far as sensation goes, you know, it's my goal to see if I can push someone to about a six or seven on their intensity scale, maybe an eight if they've been working with me for a while. Um, but we don't want the intensity actually to be super high, especially if you have a tendency for anxiety or if you have experienced trauma, you may want to go down to like the four or five range, just enough to light up those proprioceptors and, and feel into your body a little bit more, but without pushing it super hard um, to a point where it's hard to breathe deep, it's hard to move fluidly, um, or, you know, we certainly don't want you to be super sore after. But, um, you know, with emotional releases, uh, it's interesting. Sometimes they happen in the moment, which I've experienced myself many times um, and with clients many times as well, but it, it may also be in the following days, which I want to make sure we hit on because yeah. um, knowing that may give you some insight on like, why am I so upset today? <laughs> you know, I had, um, I had a client just a couple days ago, email me, we had worked on her core and she was like, hi, I just want to let you know that releasing the core was great. And I'm really excited about this work. And I've also just been crying the last two days. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm so sorry for that. But, you know, breathe into it, feel those feelings all the way through. Sometimes it does take a couple days for um, those emotions to be processed or to work themselves out. Um, I've also had a client she was fine during the session. And then I think within the hour, she was like, I was so angry. I canceled lunch with a friend because I was just feeling so much anger. And I was like, that's great. I mean, <laughs> not really, but that's, you know, something being stuck in your body that we dislodge. So know that, um, you know, emotional releases don't always happen. We can't force them to happen right. um, as much as we might like to. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they may not always happen in the moment. So being mindful over the next couple of days after you do something like that um, can give you some insight if you're if you're moving through something. So um, no need to be alarmed if you're feeling very sad or very angry the following days afterward. It's funny you mention that. I, I don't know how many emails I've had over the years or texts, you know, like, what did you do to me? <laughs> um, and most people are like, I felt amazing. But yes, then there was this emotional thing that kind of lasted a day or two or, or however it went, may be. And so I think that, you know, I like to talk about this because not many people talk about what can happen when you're actually moving things. And so it's often perceived as something negative and like, oh, she did this to me or she caused this, you know, and, and I want folks to really understand that that's not the case. In fact, it's just your body, like you said, moving through something. So what, what's some of your tips that you give to folks, you know, when they recognize like either they're more angry, they're more teary, what kind of things do you tell them to, to work with? Yeah. I mean, certainly, um, having some support is ideal. Um, if they really are committed to just feeling that feeling all the way through, we're very, uh, programmed to be like, well, I'm not allowed to feel angry. I'm not allowed to be sad right now. And so can we actually let ourselves be fully in that emotion and move through it? Because emotions are just energy in motion. And if we think about fascia again, kind of 
crinkling down a little bit when we've experienced trauma and it's forming this, this tight, tense section, that energy gets very stagnant. Blood flow can't move through that area of your body very well. Nerve signals can't travel through that area of your body very well. So by essentially like pulling wrinkles out of the plastic wrap, we're now allowing for whatever stuck fluid and energy is in that spot to move. Um, and so just being prepared, like, Hey, I don't need to know why this is happening. I don't need to put like an experience to it. This was just something that was in my body. Let's get it out of my body. I stored it for a long time. Let's make its way out. So, mm -hmm. um, certainly want to just feel that rest if you need to like really go hardcore with your self-care. If you need to take a day off of working out, or maybe you go for a walk instead, there's lots of things we can do to really care for ourselves, like a little child. You know, we along the way, whether it was physical or emotional, if we have trauma, we need to care and really nurture ourselves back to health, right? We can't just be upset that we're feeling something and want it to end. Um, so yeah, if you if you can be with it, it's as challenging as it is, it really does make a big difference. Good, good deal. Good deal. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I have to agree. Now, of course, there are situations in which we definitely want to make sure that certain folks are either under the care of a professional, something of that nature. And I, I know that that's something that I'm sure you're where you're with all of your questioning, you are watching out for It's something that is part for the course, we have to worry about those kind of things and also make sure that we're, we're being safe for everybody. Give us a kind of background on, on what you will talk to folks about if we're looking at someone that's coming in, but that doesn't have a professional that's helping with their mental health to be able to work through these sorts of things. What's kind of your blanket statement? What do you, what do you recommend? Um, I mean, I, I do recommend that they get someone that they can, you know, talk to about mental health um, or, you know, even just have a friend, on like ready to call. If you're experiencing something, tell your friend ahead of time, like, mm -hmm. Hey, seven tonight, I'm going to be doing some fascia release. I don't know what may happen again, because we can't really predict when emotional releases will come up, sure. but at least having someone that, um, knows what you're doing and you can call and they're prepared to take a call is really amazing and supportive. If you have someone in your life like that, otherwise I would say really ease into it. So instead of releasing, you know, if you're suspicious that your hips may be storing trauma instead of doing your quads, adductors, IT bands, glutes, calves, you know, kind of hitting all of these areas. Maybe you just do one, one or two and really focus on breathing. So if we can breathe in really deep down into the abdomen, we're going to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the side of our nervous system that calms us down. So it helps us be have a little bit more space for an emotion if it comes up, if we're more down-regulated. So breathing and doing just one to two spots um, is usually my blanket statement. And you can always sort of add as as time goes on, um, depending on what your experience is. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think a lot of people might be thinking now, okay, so we talked about like mental, emotional trauma. We haven't talked about physical trauma. And, and how the fascial tissue kind of plays out with that, because boy, after an acute injury, we could probably save ourselves a lot of grief down the road, you know, after a fracture, after a sprain, strain, things of that nature. And, and especially if there is a little bit of anxiety around a cast or a boot having to be put on, I'd love to hear your take on this and, and kind of what you recommend for folks about the physical trauma side of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it depends on how severe, um, you know, especially with like an impact injury, but mostly I say you want to work your fascia as soon as you can. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a story where I learned a lot about this just a couple summers ago, I was climbing Snowmass peak, which is out near Aspen in Colorado. And, um, I fell and fractured my radius, mm. which is forearm. It was a really freak accident. I had actually done all of this technical snow and ice axe climbing, and I was fine with that. Uh, but I was coming back down, and my boots were wet from all of the snow, and I just walked across this slab rock at just the right mm. angle and slipperiness, and I just wiped out, hit my right arm super hard against the rock, and I knew immediately. I was like, oh, no, this is, this is broken, uh, and I didn't know what. 
but there I could have been multiple things, but I was 10 miles from the trailhead oh, at that. No. <laughs> and so um, this is why you always go with a climbing partner. Shout out to Carrie. You're the best. Um, she really had to help me with just about everything, you know, taking on and off layers, zipping anything on my backpack. It was a pretty uh, intense journey down. Mm -hmm. And I also got back to my car and decided, you know, it had rained on us at the very end. It was a whole story. Uh, but I was wet. I was tired. We'd been backpacking. Um, we'd been hiking for like 14 hours that day. It was just all I wanted to do was go home. So from the 10 miles out with a broken arm, I also drove home with a broken arm <laughs> for about three and a half hours uh, and went to the doctor the next day. And, you know, I feel, I feel very lucky when I got there, they, you know, they're like, okay, well, you fractured your radius. And I had been thinking based on the inflammation and some weird bumps that had formed, I thought maybe I had broken my wrist or multiple bones. Oh. And so when she told me it was a fracture of the radius, I was like, oh, really? Is that it? I was so excited. <laughs> and she gave me the strangest look, like you were the most excited person to be getting this bad news. Um, but I decided right there, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get a cast. It's just a fracture, um, in a spot that, you know, I'm not super worried about. So I just got myself a brace and that very first week I was very gently, you know, maybe once a day taking off the brace and I was very gently like, uh, doing a lymphatic. I wish you guys could see what I'm doing. It's like just a very gentle lymphatic drainage motion where do it anyway, do it anyway. We'll, we'll get okay. a clip of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's like just slowly trying to move some things out from the wrist down towards the front of my arm. I started releasing a little bit of fascia around that area. So I started with releasing the bicep a little bit, releasing the pec a little bit just to maximize blood flow. And I did that. Yeah. Within a few days, I bet by day three, I was doing that and continued to do that for, um, you know, through the second week. And by the third week, I was very gently moving my wrists around in little circles. Um, and I tell you what, you guys, like, I, I think two weeks later, I hiked another mountain. Um, thankfully, it wasn't super technical. Um, you know, I was not doing a ton of climbing, but I climbed a mountain at two weeks. At four weeks, I was visiting some friends out in Roanoke, and we I was paddling on a in a canoe, like full Pocahontas style. And everyone was oh. like, how are you doing this? <laughs> how are you doing this? Uh, having just broken your arm. And it's it was about maximizing blood flow. And I I also had a little, um, you know, one of those copper wire mats that I was also, you know, putting my arm on to maximize some blood flow too. But yeah, essentially I healed my arm in about three weeks, three, four weeks tops. And uh, the doctor wanted to put me in a cast for six. And I... I truly feel I saved myself from muscle atrophy and just that restriction of being in a cast. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know we can't avoid that. Sometimes it's imperative that we do have a cast. Um, but even so, I would do something similar. So wherever your cast ends, can you sort of pull that skin and muscle towards the center of your body? We want to get all of that inflammation or fluid or whatever might be there. We want to pull it in towards the center. Um, and can you gently release fascia nearby? So if your cast is on your foot, can you do a little releasing on your calf or your hamstring, something that um, will help send blood flow down to where that fracture is? Um, but yeah, I've seen fascia release actually really improve recovery time. One of my practitioners broke her femur about a year ago um, had a full rod needed to be put in there. And she was like, I can't imagine where I would be if I wasn't releasing fascia all the time. Like it just helped the recovery so much. So um, I certainly think the sooner, you know, it's, you can and start very gentle. I, I really do think it does a lot for um, reducing recovery time. So, you know, if you've gotten a fender bender and you're feeling a little bit of whiplash, like don't wait until your massage therapist can see you in two weeks, like start releasing your fascia as soon as you can. Yeah. Sure. 
let's talk about this. What can folks do? Like, I will do little clips of you. So, so those of you guys who are listening, obviously I know it's audio, but I will put the clips on YouTube so you can see kind of what you can do to release yourself. So let, let's talk about whiplash. Let's talk about like, say someone just had a car accident and, you know, having been in multiple my 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 life you know you feel it kind of starting like afterwards you, your adrenaline's rushing right but then you get home and you're like oh no i feel it so uh-huh. give give us a couple things that we could do right away just to help ourselves before we can get into massage or cairo or whatever yeah where's my little here we go here we go i'm grabbing just a little lacrosse ball type of ball that's got a grippy surface So first and foremost, I would get into your pec muscle. So right to the inside of your shoulder bone on that squishy, muscly pocket of the chest. Um, I will lean into a door frame, you know, I lean into a wall and just gently lift and lower my hand a few times on both sides. So we really, the goal here is to compress one area and then get some of that active movement in. That's really helpful to bring in the brain to be like, okay, everything's okay. We can move in this range. There's no need to lock up, um, which sometimes uh, it does when we get that recommendation or I don't know, I even know if to call it a recommendation. Our doctor is like, just rest, don't do anything for yeah. two weeks. I think that's some of the worst advice you could possibly be given unless you've had an unbelievably serious impact injury. Um, (laughs) Otherwise, I would say, again, the sooner the better. So I release both sides of the pecs because, again, when we're coming forward with that whiplash, the chest and the front of the neck whip forward, and then we get we also get some tension on that reverberation back. But the chest will help bring the shoulders back a little bit. I also love to um, release the scalenes, which are on either side of the neck. So we have the column of our of our neck coming down. The scalene is just a little bit to the outside of the column of your neck, and you usually know when you have it. So if you're not if you're not watching this right now, you can play around with it a little bit. But I'm very gently using one to two pounds of pressure, pressing the ball just straight back towards my trap. And then tilting my head the opposite direction a little bit. I can nod my head a few times up and down. That's so helpful to relax some of those muscles that have just taken so much force (laughs) and impact. Um, And then you can lay on the ball on your trap. So, you know, again, we want to be off of the spinal cord, right? Go, Go just to one side or the other of the neck. Lay on the floor do some shoulder circles. You can lift your arm over your head, you know, whatever you can do movement wise to just get that spot cross fibering and moving a little bit. Those make such a difference. I luckily have only been in, you know, I think two fender benders, but man, the whiplash is, it's the real deal. Um, and that helped tremendously to, to work on the chest the front of the neck and the back of the neck before I could see someone else that would get in there a little bit more. No, oh, that's huge. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I find, you know, in my practice, but also just in general is giving, giving people tools that they can take action on right away when something hits the fan or something mm-hmm. happens because, you know, maybe you're outside, it's slippery out, you slip and fall, right? Still potential for, for whiplash and hopefully no fractures. Um, you know, we cross our fingers on that one, but I'm just thinking about all the different things that, you know, I think a lot of us, if we had the tools of what to do in the case of, you know, emergency, we'd be good to go. Same thing with like working with the risk, how you're talking about the leg, things of that nature. Have there been any other injuries that you can think about that may be relevant that are common? I'm, I'm just not pulling any out of the top of my head to think about what we could tell people about with, with working on things. Um, I mean, luckily, yeah, I guess I I definitely worked on myself after the last time I had a little fender bender, which is probably been four or five years ago, I think at this point. Um, But, you know, sometimes things, even if they weren't an actual accident or, you know, something, an injury that happened in the moment, um, 
I, well, it hasn't happened to me per se. I've seen this happen a bunch of times with clients, which is, um, you know, it's not, you know, you fell coming down a mountain or you got in a car accident or you came down from a jump and twisted your knee, you know, like a, an actual acute thing, but you bent down to tie your shoe and your back went out, or you woke up one morning and suddenly you had plantar fasciitis. It's like these, these things, um, are another part of injury that is like, how will I describe it? It's may or may not be physical damage because your body doesn't actually have the ability to tell the difference between what's an actual physical threat and what it perceives to be a threat. Mm -hmm. So if your fascia has slowly been tightening over time and your pelvis started to rotate and get in a wonky position and that certain muscles started to take over, certain other ones stopped working at full capacity and you kept bending down to tie your shoe in the same way over and over. Eventually there's going to be a day where your body's like, okay, we can't do this anymore. Otherwise we might herniate a disc or we might have a pretty significant injury. And so your body will light up a huge pain signal. And I think a lot of times we think of that as an acute injury, like, oh, I threw my back out, but it's like, well, I would also be absolutely working on that as soon as you can. I know it's tough when the pain is so intense and maybe you you do want to lay down for an hour or two and breathe and try to regulate, but then absolutely you want to be starting to work your quads, starting to work your IT bands, because that is also going to help get you out of that acute pain too. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard... <laughs> People will email me and they're like, hey, I, I really want to come see you, but I threw my back out. So um, when it's better, I'll come in. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? No, come right now. Like, don't wait two weeks. That's going to be the worst. <laughs> it's just going to have time to set in more compensation patterns and things like, uh, yeah, I want to remind people that, you know, if a pain just suddenly popped up, even if it's super intense, it does not mean that physical damage has occurred in your body. It's just a signal from your body that there's a potential for something to occur unless you fix a problem. And so, um, yeah, please don't take the advice of like, just rest and wait it out and hope it goes away. Um, because even if that thing goes away in two weeks, let's say, but all you did was rest and wait it out. What actually happened was your body learned to compensate and reroute around what pain was happening. And so most times that pain didn't actually be solved, but wasn't actually solved, even though you no longer feel it, which is, uh, yeah, important to realize because that thing you may turn into something else down the line, right? So say you threw your back out and you also had a knee injury a couple years later, and then, you know, uh, plantar fasciitis a few years after that, it's like those things might actually be connected because we didn't address the original thing that was going on. We just like crossed our fingers and hoped that it would go away on our, uh, on its own. Oh, yes. That is, that is by far one of the things I hear too. Like people will call me and be like, I threw my bag out, but I can't get in the car. I can't drive. I'm like, can someone just throw you in there and <laughs> just drag you back out? Um, yes. that and, and plantar fasciitis too. I mean, that, so folks who are listening, if you're wondering what that is, that's, the, that's that intense pain on the bottom of your foot when you go to get out of bed and you like put your foot down, and you're like, whoa, what is that? Um, this one too, that one comes out of nowhere. And so is your go-to kind of just getting that, using that same ball you had and just kind of rolling the foot there? And Yeah, well, plantar fasciitis um, is usually happening for one or two reasons. So number one is tension through the posterior fascial line. Um, which is the calf, the hamstring, and the glute most generally. So I actually wouldn't go to the bottom of the foot. I would release that back line first. Um, Usually that gets pretty significant results um, because that fascia line, it actually starts at at your forehead. It wraps around the back of your head. It goes down the spine and then through each glute, hamstring, and calf. And where it ends is that point of the heel where most people end up feeling that classic plantar fasciitis pain. So if you can release areas further up the chain, it usually stops pulling on that point at the bottom. Um, or secondly, which, um, I think ultimately tends to be more common is there some kind of a shift up or down or a rotation 
in the pelvis, which is creating a different gait and a mm-hmm. different wear and tear pattern, which is why so many people only feel plantar fasciitis on one foot um, because something's a little bit uneven further up the chain. So again, I, I would say, you know, what can we do to rebalance the hips? Um, cause most of the time, yeah, plantar fasciitis isn't actually a foot problem. Um, there's something else fascially speaking, pulling it out of alignment. So, um, what that maybe is a little bit more complicated if you're just a beginner at this, but absolutely foam roll your calf. That's a, that's a huge one. If you're experiencing that. I'm glad you mentioned that because yes, it's true. It isn't always the foot. Most people are going to think rolling the foot first, but yes, I find calves incredibly helpful. If I can get folks to massage their calves, work on their calves a little bit. And then something we use quite a bit is something called the chirp in our house. And so I'll have people consider that in my office. Sometimes I'll do a little like yin tong guys. This is between the eyes massage there and kind of massage up. It's there's so many things we can do when pain strikes. Um, is yeah, how I call it. So you kind of already gave us like with with of course the the whiplash situation. If someone did wake up and their neck was kind of kinked, same thing with the whiplash. Would you do the same kind of protocol? Yeah, I I woken up with some really intense uh cricks in my neck where you know I I'm unable to turn my head one direction and. Sometimes I've got to go down the rabbit hole a little bit. Sometimes it's, you know, back down in the thoracic a little bit, um, you know, releasing the rhomboids and the lats have helped, but absolutely start with, yeah, the same thing we just talked about and see, you know, um, the body craves balance. And usually when we feel pain, there's something out of balance. And so sometimes I'll just release one side first and see how it impacts everything. So, you know, the chest scaling, the trap, and see how it feels and then release the other side that maybe you think is unrelated, but in fact, it also makes a huge difference or maybe even more of a difference than the side you thought was contributing. So I also love playing that game as like just learning more about your body because the feedback that we're getting back when we do any type of healing work is so valuable. Our body is so wise. It knows what it needs. And so being able to trust that about your body of like, oh, when I have a crick in my neck, I know that if I release my, you know, pec and scalene, it makes it a lot better. There's so much empowerment that comes with just understanding our own patterns and understanding what might be contributing to our specific pain or issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, I geek out on, I know a lot of people are like, I don't know what to do. You just follow your intuition, guys, you know, and and definitely Roller Remedy. Julie's course can help you with all of finding all the spots and what to do in, in certain areas as well. Now, last but not least, I did want to ask a little bit about yoga. You know, a lot of people right now are talking about, you know, what the impact of yoga is, is having on your body. And then I just interviewed another fellow and we had talked about stretching not being that great for the body. Can you overstretch or overwork the, the fascial tissue? Is there a possibility of this? And what what happens with yoga? Is it involved in that since we're, you know, lengthening and and reinforcing maybe with yoga? Excuse my non-knowing <laughs> terminology here. I know I'm not a yogi either, so I'm not sure how if I can be super accurate as it pertains to yoga, but I'll I'll start with with what is a stretch, right? Is a stretch is lengthening of a muscle, usually in one plane of motion. So we all know the classic example of throwing our leg up on a box, hinging our hips forward to stretch our hamstrings, right? Um, But fascia doesn't really work that way. Like it doesn't really release that way. So Mm. um, one of my favorite analogies for fascia, even though it's, it's more three dimensional than just one sausage casing, but If you can envision fascia like a vacuum seal bag around your muscles and your bones, and we sucked all of the air out of that, everything crinkles down and shrinks with it, right? And so you can prop your leg up and push and lean and, you know, try to stretch that hamstring as much as possible, but you're not actually going to change much of the texture of your fascia um, because fascia loves compression. It definitely needs some cross fibering if we want to rehydrate the right areas. And it also really needs and loves movement. So stretching alone isn't a very effective way to 
release fascia. So in that regard, I would say you can't overstretch it. Um, so I've worked with a lot of people over the years with, um, you know, connective tissue degenerative diseases like mm. um, Marfan's or what's the one? It's like Ehlers Danlos. Yeah, yes. yeah, EDS. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, people with hypermobility and things like that. And that's essentially those are conditions where there's over elasticity, especially the the two former ones, over elasticity in the connective tissue. But when we work on them, it only seems to help. It doesn't actually make them any more mobile than they're supposed to be. So th there is something to the compression and the active movement where we're cross fibering instead of forcing a lengthening effect. So um, I, I think what happens, you know, could be you just strain an area of your body by forcing something to stretch that actually just needs air let back in the bag. So mm -hmm. the compression cross fibering and movement lets air back into the bag and sort of restores the movement that's supposed to be there without making it hyper mobile. Does that answer your question? I kind of went on a weird tangent. No, 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 it's, it's perfect. It's perfect. Because I think, you know, unfortunately we do have this concept of, of doing stretches and yoga and things like that. And we're, we're always talking about more flexibility, improving flexibility, but what if improving flexibility is actually improving how your fascial glide, you know, I will call it gliding of your tissues and having better proprioception to know how far you can go. And, you know, your, your joints feeling safe, I think is probably the biggest term there. Yeah, that's beautifully said. Um, cause yeah, I found, you know, we're, we're talking about plantar fasciitis and a lot, but it's such a perfect example where, you know, somebody has PF and their physical therapist might've told them to, to put their toe up on a wall and then just really crank into a calf stretch. And it actually makes their plantar fasciitis worse. And that's, that's that concept of like, Hey, maybe it, it actually doesn't need to be lengthened. We have to, it's that vacuum seal bag effect. And we actually have to restore the fascial glide and retexturize and rehydrate fascia. Maybe those are really better terms than releasing at times. It's, you know, changing the texture, changing the level of hydration. And then that really helps the pain. And so, um, getting caught in like how far you can force a lengthen, um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, we want to focus even on mobility first, you know, how fully can we move our joints through a range of motion um, before we start seeing how flexible we can come. And you're right, that proprioceptive element is super important to be like, what's too far? Um, yeah, what's going to cause confusion in the body because it has more length than other areas of the body? Um, you know, again, the body wants balance. So if you think that your hamstrings are really tight and all you do is crank on your hamstrings, maybe your brain is actually confused that there's so much length in a place and it's not in other areas. Like how tight are your quads? How tight are your IT bands? There's all of these other components that um, we want to balance instead of just forcing into that range of motion. So, so well said, because I mean, I found that even with my, my back issues and things that I've had over the years is like, yeah, there's a definite, if, if I work on my quads and I work on that lateral side of my quad towards the IT band, a lot of things will release and I don't necessarily need the work on my back per se. It's even, you know, it's there, it's, it's fascinating. And so, you know, definitely love talking with you about this so that folks can really understand that if they play with their body a little bit and they, they you know, work on rolling different areas, work on, you know, trying to see what happens if you put a foam roller somewhere and move it in, in, on your quad versus your hamstring, if you've always been doing that or somewhere else in their glutes, even too. I find that my glutes will relax if I work on my, my calves, even it's so cool how we're all so connected cool. there. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Amazing stuff here. Julia, my goodness, so many good things. And guys, like I mentioned before, I can't say enough about her roller remedy course. It's fabulous. I, I've i tried it out. I've been definitely using it. And she, she, like I just mentioned, I was talking about to the side of my quads. Julia actually got me to think about that a little bit more towards the IT band. And it's really been helping me quite a bit. So I highly recommend you guys check that out. And then of course her website, Movement by Julia. And then also Instagram Movement by Julia too. It yes. is, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. And she definitely, for those of you who are listening and are practitioners, she does some courses. You have one coming up in February. And then after that, they're kind of as 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 you see fits, or do you know your schedule for 2024? 
Uh, that is what is happening in the next two weeks in this crazy time, as at least at the time of this recording, it's, um, you know, about a week before Christmas. And so, uh, that is what's getting on the books in the next two weeks. So, um, I am doing a bodywork training February 17th through 19th. Um, if that's something of interest to you, you can contact me just via the form on my website. Um, there's a lot of new sites and courses that are going to be uploaded, but it is in the, the this last final bit of 2023 that I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to put all these up. So the schedule will be will be posted soon in the next couple of weeks. There's going to be a lot of options for 2024. Awesome. Awesome. We'll definitely make sure that we get those promoted out to everybody. And guys, head over to my website at drjkrausnd.com for the show notes for this one and, and previous ones with Julia. And I'm sure we'll have her back so we can talk more and geek out more. Because my big goal is really to teach you all how to help yourselves because Julie and I, you know, as, as practitioners, we can help you in the moment, but you know what, as much as we'd love you to move in with us, you're on your own a lot and, <laughs> and you got to be able to take care of yourself. So Julia, thanks again for coming on. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.